If you have a question for me, uh, fold it up, and let's pass them all this way so that on the ends, these ends, uh, the ushers can come pick them up. If you've got questions, hold them up, and uh, excuse me, we'll grab them. And, uh, and then Jeff is going to ask the questions. It's Jeff's birthday today, by the way, and uh, he is running sound, and so if you're thinking the sound's just a little loud, it's because his rock and roll ears can't hear anymore. So it's just, just the way it is uh, when you get to be a certain age. Uh, by the way, uh, this has nothing to do with anything, but I was handed two passes to the NASCAR race today. Uh, and there, there are two of them up here, and whoever gets up to me after the service who wants these, uh, they're, they're available for you. So, all right, Jeff. All right, we're going to start with a couple of kids' questions. The first one I just had to ask. It's from seven-year-old Allison. Uh-oh. And she wants to know, why is my brother so cute? <laughs> well, he's got good-looking parents, i got to say. Both uh, uh, Laura and Jason are, are good-looking parents, and uh, they've got a great uncle who's stunning. Stunning. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so this one is from a um, ninth grade honors biology student. Wow, cool. What are your views on evolution compared to the Bible's story of creation? All right, that's always a great question. It's a super question. Uh, and what's important to understand is what the Bible is doing and what science is doing. And unfortunately, we, we tend to confuse these two, and that gets us into trouble. The Bible, the, the opening chapters of the Bible, is not writing a scientific perspective on how the world was created. It's not the point. What the Bible isn't doing is describing how, it's describing who and why. So if you read carefully Genesis chapter 1, you have a creation story, and then you have a very different creation story in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 1's creation story, human beings are created on the last day. In Genesis chapter 2 creation story, human beings are created near the beginning of the creation story and then everything else follows because these are not stories about how it happened but about who, the who behind creation and the why behind creation. These are not scientific stories. These are truth stories about why we're here and God's vision for our lives. So does evolution contradict what happens in Genesis chapter 1 and 2? Absolutely not. If God chose to create the world using evolution, which it certainly looks like it, well then why not? There's not a conflict between those two. You can believe in evolution and still believe that God created the world. You can believe that God created the world and still believe in evolution. And so there, for me, there's no conflict whatsoever. They're doing two very different things. And more often than not, science always backs up and points us back to a creator. That's why there are so many scientists. In fact, one of the top scientists in the whole world is a believer in Jesus because he always sees science pointing back to, to God. So there's no conflict between faith and science. Uh, what is the role of this church with regard to the political discourse? Well, uh, you know, this is, this is one of those, I, I never share my political views, but this is one of those years where we're all talking about it, right? Uh, it's just fascinating uh, on so many bad levels. It's just fascinating. And, um, uh, but, but as a pastor, I don't think it's my responsibility to tell you how to vote. Um, I, I do think that as a pastor and as a church, we, we do have the responsibility to, to comment on um, some of the things that are being said that are hate-filled and divisive. I, I think as Christians, regardless of our political values, whether we're Republican or Democrat, I think all of us can agree that on both sides there have been things said that uh, don't reflect humanity, let alone decency. And I, I think we, we speak to that. But what is our role? Our role is to be good citizens. Our role is to vote. Our, our role is to get involved. And... Um, you know, if you, if you don't vote, you, don't, you can't complain. So just stop complaining. And even if you vote, stop complaining. Just, you know, once we vote, then I, I think our responsibility is to pray, uh, write people when uh, we, we disagree with them or when we want to say something. That's the role that we play. And the most important thing that we do as a, a people of faith and as a congregation of faith is we, pr we pray for our leaders as God asks us to. And if there was ever a time we needed to pray, uh, for our leaders, this is, this is the time. 
what is the difference between Lutheranism and other Protestant groups such as Methodists or Episcopalians? Basically, the Lutherans have it all right. <laughs> and Methodists, who were really birthed out of the Lutheran church, have it mostly right. Um, the, what, what sets denominations apart, and I, uh, you know, there are some people who think that denominations are a bad thing. I think they're a good thing. Uh, because no one denomination has, has the whole truth. And we need other denominations just to make sure that we're seeing things that uh, we might not see otherwise. Um, in fact, it was because we believed that we had the truth that the Catholic Church got into trouble hundreds of years ago. Uh, and uh, it needed a person like Martin Luther to stand up and say, wait, there are other ways to look at things. So Lutherans have certain understandings of how God's grace works in the world. Uh, we articulate certain things. We believe that, for example, uh, communion and baptism aren't symbols, aren't things that we do. But there's something, there, there are gifts that God gives to us, that God is active. When, when a baby is baptized, when a person is baptized, God is doing something. God is adopting that person into the family of faith. When we take communion together, God is doing something. He is giving to us Jesus tangibly. He is giving to us grace and faith and life and hope. All Protestant denominations and even the Catholic Church believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. We believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth. We believe in all the things we'll say in the creed together. But we have little nuances, and um, I happen to be a Lutheran because as I've traveled through various denominations in my life, that's the theology that speaks best to my heart and makes the most sense to me. Um, I, I married a woman who uh, was a Presbyterian, and I led her to faith. And um, <laughs> we, we were married in a Presbyterian church. I went to a Baptist seminary for a year. I went to a Covenant high school. I attended an evangelical free church when I was in, in junior high and high school. Um, my brother, uh, not Jeff, my other brother is a Baptist pastor. We lost one to the dark side. So we... <laughs> You know, so I, I'm familiar with all the denominations, or many of them, uh, and I appreciate many of the things from all of them. Um, but I'm Lutheran because I think it best articulates the, the, the scandal and the recklessness of God's grace. So I got several of these questions. So just to clarify once again, we are still a part of the Lutheran Church. Yes, so um, we are a part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which is the largest Lutheran denomination in the country. Uh, for those of you who aren't real familiar with Lutherans, if you want to be a Lutheran denomination, you have to be able to say it with letters, all right? So we are the ELCA. You can't be a Lutheran denomination without being able to say it with letters. So we're the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. There's also the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, LCMS. There'll be a quiz on this afterwards. And then there's the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, the W-E-L-S or E-S-L or what, I, I don't even know what it is. But, but we're a part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. We are responsible to that church. We have a bishop who oversees us and holds us accountable. Uh, the bishop attends our church occasionally when he's not out uh, preaching at other churches. And so we are very, very closely tied. I just did a couple events uh, last month for the Lutheran Church, ELCA. So we are very, very connected to that denomination. Uh, this will probably be the last one, Jeff. Unless you have two really good ones, but... Well, I actually do. Okay. If you got the time. Okay, the I've, first... I've got the time. It's... Okay, great. Um, well, this one's never been asked before, and I just found it intriguing, so here it goes. Um, how does God feel about soldiers who've served in wars and have had to see and do things, and how does God's grace fit into that? Uh, okay, so I'm not a soldier. I, I don't come from a soldiering family. We don't have a lot of that in our history. I had an uncle who served in World War II. Um, but but I, I would say this, that um, to be a, a soldier, uh, to fight for one's country is an honorable profession. Um, it is a necessary profession. Uh, Luther talks a lot about um, to help us understand the, the way that God works in the world. He talks about God's right hand and God's left hand. And God's right hand is the way that God rules, so to speak, through the church by bringing grace through the sacraments and through the proclamation of the word. And then how God rules with the left hand through the law and through laws that have been established to keep us safe and through people who fight to protect us and through armies. And, and there are times when it becomes necessary for people to rise up and sacrifice their lives on behalf of our nation 
uh, in order to protect our religious liberties, to protect our freedoms, um, and to protect us right now from terrorism. Uh, so it is an honorable, noble profession, and I, I think that God uh, takes great delight in people willing to sacrifice. And really, in many ways, there are very few professions in life that model for us the sacrifice of Jesus the way that being a person who serves in our, our armed forces does. Um, our soldiers see horrific things. Um, our, our soldiers come back wounded and are never really put back together completely. And we have many of you here who have served, and you know what I'm saying, that, that life is always going to be different. And I think what our soldiers would tell you, who, who are followers of Jesus, that where grace comes in is it helps them live Right? and live with themselves and, and live with the things that they've had to see and, and gives a grace and a forgiveness and a mercy uh, and, and a hope and a support that carries them through uh, stuff that most of us can't even imagine. Uh, and so I, I think that God loves them. I think that God's grace comes to them and meets them where they are and values them. And uh, I, I just think, again, it's appropriate for us to applaud all of those who, who serve our country. So let's, let's do that. I mean, they're just great people. And then finally, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? Um, yeah, so I've been asked this one at every service so far. It's a good, it's a good question, and I said it changes all the time. <laughs> right now it would be, why are these people running for president? That would be the question I'd be asking <laughs> right now. Um, and um, uh, I, last night I got uh, a little emotional answering it, May again, uh, because I, I think probably in the end, when I finally come face to face with Jesus, there will be no questions. I might see some of you and say, how did you get here? But I, there would be... <laughs> well, I know some of you. Uh, but I, I think, you know, probably it will just... Uh, I'll see Jesus just fall flat on my face. And all I'll be able to say is, wow. Probably behind that question is, how did I get here? Right? But just wow. I don't think there are going to be any more questions. I think we'll just see Jesus and it will just all somehow make sense. That we're in, we're in the presence of pure grace without any filters at all. And... and we'll just fall on our faces and be stunned at a grace that was so much deeper than we even imagined. And um, so I, I think that's what's going to happen for all of us someday when we meet our Creator face to face. So with that, let's stand and confess together our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed that Christians and Catholics all across the, or Protestants and Catholics say all around the world, let's do it together.